Okay, so uh, our, our topic for tonight is about the Tory confiscations that occurred in 1778 you know, here in Clarendon. Uh, that decade was probably the most tumultuous decade you know, in this town's history uh, with all of the New Hampshire grant versus New York grant, you know, controversy, who's running, you know, Vermont. Uh, but in 1777, you know, the events lined up for what happened here in 1778. That, you know, January 15th, 77, uh, Vermont declared independence. You know, we're not New Hampshire, we're not New York, we're us. By July 2nd, Vermont adopted, uh, the new government here, state government, adopted a constitution. But then just five days later, uh, we had the Battle of Hubbardton. And not less than six weeks after that, in the middle of August, you had the Battle of Bennington. You know, so at this point, the Revolutionary War has gotten up close and personal for Vermont. You know, this brand new state, you know, uh, the state didn't have money. It's barely just forming its first government. Uh, we're in the midst of the Revolutionary War. And the mechanism that the new legislature in Vermont chose to finance the war, because we didn't have laws, we didn't have taxes, they passed a tax on Tories, uh, which is very easy to calculate. What you own, the tax is 100 you percent. Know, basically, they were taking everything, uh, all of the property, you know, the land, the structures, the animals, the equipment, uh, that these were total confiscations. And Vermont had, uh, I don't know how many totally in Vermont, but Clarendon had 30 confiscations, 30 men whose property was confiscated. And that was more than any other town in Vermont. And whether Vermont just had a lot more Tories, or I mean Clarendon rather, had a lot more Tories than other towns in Vermont, or Clarendon was more diligent in weeding out the Tories. Uh, but there were 30 of them, which was a lot for you know, the population at, at the time. But it was the proceeds from selling, taking their properties, you know, selling it off. That's what Vermont used to finance its war efforts. In the history book done in 1976 uh, here in town, there is a chapter you know, talking about the confiscations uh, the listing, you know, the 30 individuals whose land was taken, but it didn't say what happened to them. So a few years ago, I was kind of curious. It's like, okay, we had all these people. What became of them? So I started, went on the internet, started researching them, and one after another, it kept coming up that in 1778, they were on this tax list in Bennington. And I'm thinking, what's going on? Was Bennington a very Tory-friendly place that they took shelter? You know, when they were booted out of, you know, Clarendon, uh, I, I had no idea, uh, but they were in Bennington. So I contacted the Historic Society down there in the Bennington Museum, and they put me in contact with a gentleman, Bob Moore, uh, who was writing a book. And I talked to him last summer, I think, and he hadn't finished the book yet, but he was going to be talking about this. So at that point, I started researching you know, the individuals to find out what happened. The reason they were in Bennington is because they were arrested. You know, first, they were the ones some escaped. Uh, they got out of town before they got arrested. The ones that didn't get out of town first were arrested. Most of them were brought down to jail in Bennington. Uh, there were a few arrestees that may have gone over to Windsor, uh, but basically Bennington was the center of the Revolutionary War effort because at that time, uh, Bennington was the most developed community you know, in the state that 
you had the facilities down there for managing a war effort. Uh, so that, this is why they were on this. Then it was called a tax list because basically the confiscations was deemed a tax. It just happened to be a 100% tax you know, of what they had. Uh, <clears throat> of the 30 uh, individuals you know, whose property was taken, you know, three of them died during the war. Some of these, were, they escaped, you know, they crossed over into British lines, and several of them joined the British, you know, army. Uh, three died, you know, during, they didn't survive the war. Ten of the 30 uh, made it to Canada. Uh, Ten made it, uh, ended up in New York. New York, for whatever reason, was much more Tory friendly than Vermont. And that might stand to reason a little bit in that, you know, a lot of them, some of them, they came from there and, you know, they had connections and roots there. But ten went to Canada, ten ended up in New York, uh, one ended up in Massachusetts. Three ended up elsewhere in Vermont, you know, not, not Clarendon, and only one was ever allowed back into Clarendon, and that was Daniel Marsh. Uh, and I don't know what it was about him, but all was forgiven. Uh, the legislature, I think in 1782, allowed, uh, basically approved him coming back and getting his property back. Uh, and then some years after that, the person who had bought his land, you know, when it was auctioned off, you know, petitioned the state to get paid for his losses uh, involved with that. But Daniel Marsh did get his property back, and that would have been, you know, down here on, you know, Middle Road. Uh, but he is the only one out of the 30 that came back here, because basically, you know, you're gone. Uh, and, you know, with 10 going to New York to more Tory-friendly communities and 10 to Canada, which, of course, was, you know, they're, they're loyalists, uh, you know, in Canada. Uh, and even people that didn't go to Canada, they were petitioning, many of them after, long after the war, uh, for their losses, that the British government, they lost their property here in Clarendon, uh, and the British government was paying some of them you know, for their loss, but it was years and years later, you know, that they were, that, that was occurring. Uh, and that was for <clears throat> both people who went to Canada and people who were still in the U.S. Uh, you know, but that was up to the British government. This book here, it's State Papers of Vermont, Volume 6, Sequestration, Confiscation, and Sale of Estates. Between 1918 in 1991, the state published what they call their state paper series. And in this series, uh, I think there are 29 books in all. Uh, the first 18 are useful to us, and I acquired 13 of the 18, haven't found the others yet. But this book in its entirety covers in great detail the individuals, you know, not just Clarence and across Vermont, uh, you know, individual, the legal documents of uh, showing, you know, when they took their property and they're auctioning it off, first they had to see, did they owe any debts? So if they're, <clears throat> you know, taking, you know, pick a name, uh, Jeremiah Spencer's property, you know, first they were checking, did Jeremiah owe anybody money in town? Uh, and the debtors would get paid, the state would take the rest. You know, of the proceeds. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and, but the details of, you know, their land being sold, who was buying it, you know, and sometimes one person's buying the land, someone else is buying the oxen, you know, or other pieces of the equipment. Um, so, for researchers who may have family members that were affected here, and some of them would be collateral, uh, 
you know, you're thinking, okay, these people were kicked out in 1777, 1778. Of course, their, their descendants aren't here, you know, for the most part. Only Daniel Marsh came back. Uh, but a lot of these were just like in the Civil War, you know, where you had family on both sides of it. Uh, some of these people were related to people that stayed. Uh, you know, that, you know, the fact that, you know, some families may have bet, okay, there's no way this ragtag farmers and merchants are going to defeat the greatest military on the planet. Uh, okay, I'm going to bet with them, you know, versus people that instead are betting on, you know, okay, no, we, the king's got to go, we're here. And, you know, they can be in the same family. Uh, but, for, but there is a tremendous detail, you know, available, you know, not particularly exciting detail, but you see the transactions, and for a lot of these people, you know what they owned, you know, at the time. <clears throat> There was no, you know, essentially it's, you know, the men, okay, the, the men owned the, the property and the men, if they didn't escape uh, across the British lines, uh, you know, they were arrested, okay. The wives and children weren't arrested, they're still here. I mean, some of the wives and children managed to, you know, get out of town. Uh, make their way to Canada, but some of them were still here. <clears throat> and in those days, you did not have any social programs. Okay, now, you know, the husband's in jail or he's fighting for the British, you know, over in New York, uh, and we've just taken your farm, your animals, your equipment, you know, your livelihood, you know, so you still had women and, the, you know, the wives and children are here. Uh, <clears throat> with no provision, you, you know, there weren't welfare programs. Uh, and <clears throat> in that era, and continuing in up through, <clears throat> excuse me, the early 1800s, people were warned out of town. If you couldn't support yourself, and the town could lay claim someone else is responsible for you, you would be basically ordered to leave town. You know, if your roots were in Rutland, they're saying, we're not going to support you. You're Rutland's problem. And legally, you know, you would be kicked out. Now here you have, you know, we've just arrested the husband. You know, he's uh, a traitor to the country, uh, so to speak. Uh, the town isn't going to support their wives and children. <clears throat> you know, so it was, it was a very, I mean, it, it was a very, difficult, you know, period. But there were individuals, and it's, you find the details, you know, in the book here, who stepped forward, uh, not people in Clarendon, but people in New York State, people down in Pownall or in Rutland or some other communities, uh, stepped forward you know, posting bond that they will support, you know, these wives and children. <clears throat> and sometimes they would have been relatives or, you know, they're connected in some fashion. Uh, but we know who these people are that said, okay, I, I will, you know, cover them. Uh, and in some cases, you know, the wives and children would have moved to <clears throat> places like Steventown, New York. Uh, where their sponsor was. Uh, I mean, some of them would have been taken in by other relatives. You know, if you, part of your, your husband's on this, you know, the Tories, the Loyalist side, uh, but other of your relatives are here in Clarendon and they're on the Patriot side and they're still here, they may have taken in, uh, you know, wives and children. Uh, but some of them didn't have someone locally taking them in and either they relocated to a place uh, where they would be cared for, be it, you know, New York or, you know, Quebec, uh, <clears throat> you know, but if they stayed here, it would have been, there's some, some of them people uh, funded, you know, their, you know, their existence for a period, uh, you know, but 
you know, things were pretty harsh. Uh, they were not particularly taking, you know, pity, you know, on people, you know, at all. Uh, and bear in mind, you know, th there was a war going on. Uh, and, you know, wars never bring out the best in people, you know. And a lot of these people <clears throat> were related, uh, you know, you had family groupings, you know, we had Moses Bodish, whose wife was a Nichols, um, and Gideon Brayton, whose wife was also a Nichols, a sister to the other one, and you, just, you know, get a lot of connections. Uh, then we had Joseph Brayton and Thomas Brayton, two of his sons. Uh, you know, so the sons were old enough to own their own property at that point, you know, but the whole family is, you know, gone. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Thomas Bull, he was the one, he kicked out of this town, but he ended up in Danby. That was, other than Daniel Marsh coming back to Clarendon, he was the one who was the closest, if you will, uh, to staying in the area. <clears throat> you know, you had James Clark, who was a, an immigrant from, you know, Scotland, who had first been in Canada, and somehow he came down to Clarendon, got on the wrong side of history, uh, and lost what he had here, and was back in Canada. Uh, here's an example of what I had talked about before. Oliver Colvin, uh, you know, he was first cousin once removed to Jeremiah Colvin, and Jeremiah Colvin was the progenitor of the Clarendon Colvin clan, you know, that's still here today. Uh, you know, so this was a cousin. And we saw that in, you know, other families. It's, you know, siblings came, but cousins came. You know, we had at least three Potter families, you know, come here. Uh, and one of them was barely related to the others. You have to go back hundreds of years to find a connection, you know, but they came here. But in this case, you know, you had Colvin cousins here on both sides. Uh, you know, one, one left, one stayed. Uh, you know, Comfort Curtis, whose uh, wife, whose uh, was brother to Content Curtis, uh, you know, who was the wife of Joseph Brayton, you know, that we had, you know, just, you know, mentioned. Uh, and we had John Curtis, who is Comfort's brother, you know, another one where, you know, again, the whole family is uh, going. You know, Thomas Green, uh, you know, he joined Burgoyne's army uh, and stayed, you know, fought over Saratoga. I mean, some of these people, I mean, you're talking that joined the British, they were fighting over Saratoga and down to Bennington. Uh, you know, which is why ones that were taken prisoner, uh, especially the Battle of Bennington, a British that were taken prisoner, the, if you were a British regular, a British soldier, you got better treatment than if you were a Vermont Tory. If you were a Vermont Tory and you were captured at the Battle of Bennington, uh, the treatment was said to be much harsher than if you were a British regular. Uh, the British regular, okay, you're fighting for your country. The Vermont Tories, it's you're fighting against your country, as opposed to, you know, that you're not British. You know, you're American and you're fighting on the wrong side. Uh, you, know, <clears throat> you know, Daniel, we have Daniel Hill, uh, I mean, he tried to get Vermont to pay him for his losses, saying it wasn't him. You know, you get Daniel Hill and Daniel Hill Jr., and he basically threw his son under the bus, saying, well, my son was the one occupying the property. Uh, 
you know, so, you know, it was illegal to take it because I owned it, but he was occupying it, and so you didn't have a right to take my property just because he happened to be occupying it. Uh, and, you know, that kind of argument might fly today, but, it, you know, it didn't fly in, you know, uh, 1770s. You know, so, of course, they lost their land. Uh, and then Timothy Hill, and that one I actually haven't figured out how he's related to the other hills, but clearly there would be a relationship, you know, there. Uh, there was Amariah, you know, how, you know, another one ended up, you know, in Canada, you know, uh, Simpson, you know, Jenny, uh, you know, Solomon Johns, you were interested in, you know, Phil. Uh, Solomon Johns is someone we actually know where, you know, he lived, where his site is, uh, you know, down on the Congdon farm, you know, now, you know, out in the field. But he's someone, and we have it on our website, that, you know, he, you know, ended up in Ontario, and a lot was written about him up there. Uh, you know, just as, you know, we put up our markers and we're, you know, honoring our Revolutionary War soldiers, well, up there they, they honor their loyalists. Uh, you know, and that makes perfect sense. And, you know, he's a loyalist that a lot was written about. And so amongst all of the people, we probably know more about Solomon Johns than, you know, any of, you know, any of them. Uh, you know. John Lee, another one went to, there were several of these people went to Steventown, New York. Uh, and so it could be that it's just part of their families. Because a lot of the, you know, these early settlers, you know, they were related, they came from the same towns down in Rhode Island or down in Connecticut. Or they had, you know, they were related through marriage, you know, to each other. And some of the families that came to Clarendon must have had parts of their families go to Steventown because that name keeps popping up. You know, Steventown is down near the Massachusetts border. You know, that, that part of New York. You know, there. Uh, you know, there's Joseph Lewis. You know, you know Daniel Marsh, as I said. You know, he was the only one I ever allowed back. Though his coming back was somewhat controversial. He, you know, it was in 1782, there was a petition to restore his citizenship, uh, you know, in Vermont. Uh, you know, he was in, down in Connecticut, you know, living at that point. Uh, and the petition was signed by 51 men. And some of the ones that signed the petition were the local officials that were managing the confiscation. So something caused a total change of mind. It's like we made a mistake with this Daniel Marsh guy. Uh, they didn't do that for anyone else. And then it was an act of the legislature in 1782, letting him, you know, back uh, and also restoring his property. Uh, but it took another three years after that to actually give him get him his property back because there's someone living there who's saying, "Wait a minute, I bought this property at auction." Uh, <clears throat> Daniel Marsh did go on to, to then represent Clarendon in the legislature. <laughs> you know, we took his property, kicked him out. 1782, we allow him back in. In 1784, we elect him to represent Clarendon in the legislature. Uh, so it was quite a rehabilitation for him. But it was not without controversy because in 1786, there was a petition signed by 34 men in Clarendon to uh, not seat him in the legislature, uh, which means he had a lot of people here saying, okay, we made a mistake with this guy, we want him back in town, but it wasn't universal. Uh, but the people, you know, wanting him back, obviously they prevailed, he was seated, you know, he served for, you know, four years, you know, in this uh, legislature. And it took till 1791 for the guy who had bought his property to get his money. 
back for the improvements he made. I mean, those wheels turned, you know, very slow. <clears throat> there was Joshua Matson, you know, who would have been related to Francis, you know, Matson, uh, you know, West Timoth Road, uh, you know, old house that's, you know, the house is still there. Uh, you know, the Matson family, you know, had occupied, and again, this was just a split family, and, you know, this guy was a cousin, you know, uh, again. You know, Philip Nichols, you know, earlier we had Zilpha Nichols and Rebecca Nichols. Uh, you know, again, there weren't <clears throat> the, a lot of total strangers moving here. There were people that are moving here because they know people that are moving here and friends and relatives from, you know, where they came from. And, you know, you get in these small population places, you know, families are marrying into families. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Elijah, you know, Osborne, uh, you know, he, he died, one of them that died, you know, fighting for the British. Uh, there was Jeremiah Parker, who, he, this is one I haven't figured out, you had a lot of Parkers in the North Clarendon part of town, particularly, but they, ended up spreading throughout the whole town. There were a lot of Parkers here, and I haven't been able to figure out how he's related to them, but it's, he probably is. But he, this was one, he lost his property here, uh, but he clearly was an unrepentant you know, Tory, because he was known, instead of being referred to as Jeremiah, who was known as Tory Parker. You know, right up till he died. Uh, you know, he had originally come from, you know, Massachusetts, and after being in Clarendon, uh, you know, he settled in Charlestown, New Hampshire, uh, and then it ended up, you know, coming across over to, you know, Springfield, Vermont, you know, ultimately. Uh, but he, went through, and he lived to 1833, so he spent a lot of time known as Tory Parker. So, you know, the war may have been lost, you know, but he, he did not give up his British loyalty, you know, in that regard. Uh, you know, Samuel Richardson, you know, another one who joined the, you know, British Army. Uh, and, and this book does include uh, the ones that petition the British to get paid, you know, for their losses. Um, there was a bunch of Spencers. You know, Spencer is one another name that people, you know, uh, still here in town. Uh, but the Spencers in the 1800s were, you know, very prominent and into the 1900s, very prominent family in town. But we had. <clears throat> Uh, Barnard Spencer, who, you know, ended up in Canada. Uh, then we had Benjamin Spencer. Uh, he died at Ticonderoga, uh, in, actually in 1777. He got out of town, you know, over to British lines, you know, before the confiscations began. Uh, but that didn't stop the confiscation process you know, of the land he left behind. <clears throat> you know, Hazelton Spencer, who's the son of, uh, you know, Benjamin, you know, he made it to, you know, Canada as well. Uh, Jeremiah Spencer, who is a, you know, cousin, you know. Uh, but even though we had four Tory Spencers here, there are other Spencers that are here in state you know, another, you know, kind of split, you know, family. Uh, you know, William uh, Sutton, uh, he actually, he came back not far from here himself. Uh, he was one of them that came back to Vermont, uh, to Brandon, uh, you know, afterwards. You know, so not too, too far. Uh, Daniel Walker, another, uh, you know, you have Lewis Walker, 
you know, in Chippenhook and, you know, the progenitor of a very large, you know, Walker family. Well, Daniel was Lewis's first cousin. Uh, you know, and, you know, he, he ended up up in, you know, Canada as well. Uh, yeah, the one of these guys, let me see which one made it to Canada and it didn't work out so well. He wasn't there all that long and a tree fell on him. But, you know, and all of, you know, what I'm, you know, looking at here, this is on our website, uh, the, in our Soldiers and Wars collection, uh, it's called uh, Tory Prisoners, I think is what I labeled it, uh, you know, but, you know, all of this, and this is something I update periodically, I updated a little bit yesterday. You know, as I go in, and because sometimes, as time goes on, there's more and more data that becomes available, you know, on people, and so I can flesh out uh, people a little bit, you know, more. Uh, but it's, you know, was a, you know, at times it's hard to fathom, <laughs> you know, here, okay, is a town, be sort of like saying everyone that belongs to, you know, this political party today you're going to jail and we're taking all your property. Uh, I mean, that was kind of, you know, the equivalent, you know, except here you're in a wartime situation and you're in a state that, well, it wasn't even a state yet, but, you know, you're in a, in Vermont that has literally just formed its first government. It does not have a revenue, any revenue stream uh, does not have uh, much of anything. You know, they just formed. Uh, this was the first tax. And to put in perspective, I looked up, in 1770, uh, the estimates of population, and bear in mind, 1770, you still got the New Hampshire versus New York thing going on. And you've got, uh, you know, no one is taking a census of, okay, this is, Vermont, you know, because no one considered it Vermont, you know, at the time, you know, that the estimates range from 10 to 25,000 people is all that was here. And, you know, most of this was wilderness. Fast forward to 1780, now you've got a Vermont government that's been in place for several years uh, and, you know, a lot more control. And the estimates range from 40 to 47,000 people, you know, that I saw, you know, in Vermont. Which means you go back to 1777, 1778, uh, clearly there would have been 30 some thousand people, you know, here in Vermont. That's not much of a base to raise tax, to fund a war, uh, to do much of anything. And, you know, so that's why it starts becoming a little understandable that it was expedient. One, we don't want these people here because, uh, you know, they're on the wrong side of the equation that we've decided here. Uh, uh, the war is on our doorstep over Hubbardton, you know, down Bennington or, you know, Saratoga. Uh, we don't have any money uh, or we don't have a system really to raise money, you know, at that point in time. Uh, so great solution. We get rid of the people we don't want and we take everything they have. Uh, and that's basically what happened. It, I mean, you could never, you know, it's not the way it happened in the other colonies because the other colonies were long established. You know, they had systems. Uh, they were more populated, all of them were more populated than, you know, Vermont was. You know, more different than Vermont was because this was new territory. Uh, you know, there are very few people. Anyway, prior to researching these people, nothing was documented as to what became of them. You know, we knew who they were, we knew their property was, even here, you know their property is confiscated, uh, but you don't know what became of them. You know, it's almost as if that part historically wasn't that interested, it was more the initial action. Uh, but it was just kind of curiosity that, you know, 
led me to start, you know, researching them. Uh, Dave, you had a question? I've done a couple of things. One is I've Daniel Marsh, mm -hmm. uh, he actually credit for uh, Revolutionary War service mm. prior to when he got in trouble as a Tory. Mm. So, uh, Kevin, do you know, is he buried in the Marsh Cemetery there? No, I took <coughs> some stones in both cemeteries, the Flats and the Marsh, mm. with Marsh names on them. I really have mm. yeah. taken a look. And, and Dave, on what you were saying here, some of these people uh, had served in the military in the uh, French and Indian Wars. You know, some of these people may have been veterans in the 1760s down in Rhode Island or in Connecticut. Uh, you know, but it was sort of a different war, different time when they were serving in the you know, military before coming here, you know, they were British. You know, that, yeah, they may have been American, but people consider themselves, you were still British subjects, and you know, they were serving in the military, you know, that they were veterans. Uh, it's just the Revolutionary War came and everyone had to pick a side uh, and the side they picked, you know, was not the side that the Vermont the newly formed Vermont government said was going to be tolerated. Uh, yeah. but the other thing I wanted to mention about was uh, uh, Francis Madison, and I think you said he was cousin to Joshua. Mm. And uh, Francis Madison lived over in Tinmouth, uh, and he lived where the square farm is, and he got killed. <coughs> in a confrontation, a shootout, mm -hmm. uh, on his, his door, well, on his front yard. <coughs> and it, it's written about in detail in the uh, Dandy history. Uh, and he got shot by a bunch of loyalists that came and accused him of being a spy because he went over to the White Hall to, when the British were invading down the Champlain <coughs> Valley, and it, you know he alleged he was looking for protectionist papers, and they considered he was you know giving them knowledge about. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure there was a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, there was a confrontation, and he ended up shot in the chest and killed him. And they confiscated his land in Tinmouth, which was the square property now. And they buried him in the gravel pit on the south side of the square road there that goes through the square property. And then the road crew in around the 1930s or something like that were, you know, by hand digging out gravel from that gravel pit and they struck his grave and so they disinterred him from that gravel pit and put him uh, into the cemetery that's, that's there on the Slayer property which contains a lot of nobles and uh, they put him in an unmarked grave except for a field stone there and Henry Potter who I bought my, my property from, who was a predecessor in the Potter lineage. He went to his dentist when he was about 18, and his dentist had John, uh, had, I guess that's John Irish, isn't it? That was kept there. Yeah. And uh, he had his skull, uh, which when they disinterred him, they sent the skull to the Vermont Historical Society, thinking that it might have some kind of historical merit. And uh, of course, the Historical Society wasn't really interested in human remains. So apparently, Henry's dentist was uh, uh, the person that.
was connected to the historical society and got the skull back. And he knew Henry lived in that neighborhood. <coughs> so he gave the skull to Henry. Henry took the skull and left it upstairs in his house mm -hmm. for years. It was there. And when he was about 90, <laughs> he decided that that skull should be placed with the rest of the body. And so at 90, he was a little infirm. And he asked me if I would help him to put the skull back where it might belong. And I said, I would. And uh, so he showed me where the field stone was that marked the, the disinterred grave of John Irish. And, uh, and uh, we dug down about three feet, and you know, I hit something that could have been a bone or something like that. And I said, I think we've gone far enough. And it was in a, it was in a shoebox, the skull. And uh, so I looked in the shoebox, and sure enough, there was a skull in there. And uh, so I just put shoebox skull and all into that hole and covered it up. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, <laughs> well, we don't have any headless horsemen running around Chilliwack anymore. Well, that's good. So that's good. But John Irish was, you know, he was uh, 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 killed because of basically yeah. what we're talking about. Only yeah. led to his. Well, I have another one here with uh, Solomon Johns. Yeah. I, I will, following what Dave just said, you know, I, I do have here kind of a you know interesting uh, account, and this is from the October 1947 Vermont Quarterly in an article that was uh, called "Indian and Tory Raids on the Otter Valley, 1777-1782." Late in July or early early August of 1777, many of the inhabitants were still out of the Otter Valley, having evacuated immediately after the Battle of Hubbardton. But one persistent Whig, Nathan Tuttle of Rutland, stayed behind to defy the Tories. Tuttle, who was said to have been a heavy drinker, was drunk when he met up with a party of Indians led by two Tories, Solomon Johns and Gust Gustavus Spencer of Clarendon. Tuttle immediately started a row and dared them to take him. The taunts continued until Johns got so mad that he ran Tuttle through with his bayonet and killed him. Spencer and Johns then tied stones to his body and threw it into the creek below Gulkins Falls. After having disposed of the body, they all went to Joseph Keeler's house nearby and told him the story, begging him to swear secrecy. After the war, Johns was killed in Canada by a falling tree, and so Keeler felt it was safe to publish the particulars of Tuttle's death. Uh, yeah, so actually, it was Solomon Johns was the one who, you know, wasn't there all that long for a tree fell on him up in Canada and died. <laughs> but <clears throat> it was a different time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to mention John Irish's wife and kids. Uh, they confiscated his land mm -hmm. and they, the family moved to Danby. That's why the count of the, uh, John Irish's killing from his life's perspective, uh, is in the Canadian history. Yeah, it's and John Irish would have been Shannon one of the Tin Myth confiscees. He would have been one of the Tin Myth, you know, confiscees. You know, that's why he's not on my list. I was only Clarendon. Because Irish, actually, he was in Tin Myth. Yeah, and, yeah. and you're right, Jen, uh, Francis Madison was in Clarendon. <clears throat> he was actually on part, part of the part. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, <clears throat> you know, the guy that probably cleared those meadows and stuff in the right in back of the house. Yeah. In fact, the Solomon John. In fact, he's buried there. He's buried there. Yeah. The Solomon John's guy is actually probably one of the more interesting, uh, you know, ones here. He had served in the British military as a lieutenant in the King's Rangers. On uh, August 1780, uh, a guy named Steele Smith was paid for housing and feeding Solomon, another guy named William Buell, and their guards in Windsor, Connecticut. They had been arrested and brought to Windsor, where some people were jailed there. 
Uh, Colonel Ebenezer Woods was paid uh, that same month for capturing both men, so they escaped from jail in Windsor, they got captured again. Uh, and then uh, September 1780, Lieutenant L. Nathan Strong was paid to bring Johns and Buell to Bennington uh, to, to house them down there in jail. Uh, but he ended up in uh, Elizabethtown, Ontario, where he died in 1786. Uh, guess what? Tree fell on him. You know, but he, but there's a lot written about him, and I think I have we have a separate entry in our our collection because uh, I found this rather large account of him uh, out of Canada, uh, but. We know where he lived, and Bill has done some work on the site. Right now, it's part of the Compton Fields. You know, I think it's kind of an interesting subject. Uh, but everything with the 1770s is here. We, you know, before this, and you know, the New Hampshire grants versus New York grants. Uh, you know, uh, the Green Mountain boys. You know, coming here, and you know, some of the accounts, a uh, few of which we've got on our you know website. <clears throat> you know, the accounts of what was being done to New York officials. Uh, in fact, maybe that was practice for what happened in 1778 with the confiscations. You know, when the t uh, Green Mountain Boys were literally running uh, New York officials out of town. You know, here uh, because. This, this town was under New York control, uh, you know, for a period, you know, until they were all afraid to uh, be here. And one other thing I know is people were able to sort of switch sides. You know, some of the research we've done, uh, we have Frederick, or Charles Buttons, rather, you know, one of the absolute first, if not the first settler in town. Uh, where there are indications that he was also a Tory, but he owned a lot of property here, and he seemed to be smart enough to read the tea leaves and place his bet on the uh, Patriot side, uh, and said, I'm with you guys, and let his oxen be used to haul cannon uh, over towards Boston. Uh, but there were some indications that you know he would have been a Tory, uh, but you know just as with the New York officials that were here, if they were able to renounce New York control, you know I'm not going to work for the state of New York anymore. You were fine, you know they weren't going to kick you out of town, but if you insisted that New York, this is New York, and we're doing it the New York way, okay, you're. You suffered the consequences, uh, but it was the same thing with you know Tories versus you know uh, Tories versus Whigs really, uh, you know Patriots versus Loyalists, you know that if you were willing to say no, nope, I'm going to be on your side, you know that would be okay. But if you're you know adamant, absolutely no, I'm subject of the king, I'm on that side. Well, you know that was the consequences. Uh, and you have to bear in mind from that uh, with the Battle of Hobbiton, you had you know people fleeing you know the area even, uh, and so if you were a Tory, uh, and the British are doing quite well in the war at this point, you know at least up here, you say okay I'm going to be protected by you know the British, you know uh, you didn't have a whole lot of incentive to be saying oh no these guys are never going to win. Was kind of looked like they probably were, uh, and it was the non-loyalists, you know, that were fleeing, uh, you know, the area, uh, and things changed rather rapidly, you know, that you know the new Vermont government kind of got control of things, and you know, this literally was one of the first things they did, uh, you know, so. The situation changed rapidly uh, as to who was on top, you know, of this game, and you know, people chose sides, but people were able to switch sides, you know, uh, you know, in the rest.
rest is history. 